Lee Clark. <laughs> Lee, welcome on. Welcome down to the Surf Cafe. Great to have you here. And uh, going back to the start, really, just tell us how you uh, how you started your football career. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Great to be here. Nice and intimate. <laughs> it's been in the front room. It is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the, the football world for me was a little bit different. Started me primary school as a as a six-year-old. That was quite lucky, actually. Um, I was keeping the ball up in the schoolyard, and the football teacher at the time, Jim Horrocks, he was walking past, and he said to us, Hey, son, you got your football boots? Because we're a player short for the school team tonight. And... Uh, the teacher who was looking after us at that lunchtime, she said, well, you can't, he's only in the top infants class. He's only five, six years of age. And, and I was like, no, no, I can't, I can't. I, I haven't got my boots, but I can easily get to the bottom of the bank where I lived. It was a couple of minutes away and went and got me Woolworths orange stripes and um, then <laughs> then got to be the substitute for the school team under 11s and then they put us on. And, and after that, it just, snowballed really and then I was in the team all the time and I remember our, we had West Walker, Ian Bogue, he was playing for West Walker, St Vincent's around the walk area, Paul Stevenson and Jeff Wrightson, lads four or five years older than me and uh, but things were going well and then a guy came up was after one game, Brian Clark, no relation, he was part of the famous Walls End Boys Club and he said listen would like to come and train with Walls End, be part of the team. And Jim, the school teacher, sat to say, Brian, because he knew who he was, mm -hmm. you do realise Lee, he's only six. And at that time, the youngest team they had at Walls End was 11. <clears throat> and the youngest he had to be was nine. So I went to Walls End, I was doing the training. And what they used to do at the time, um, used to put me down on the team sheet as like an anonymous player. That Whichever player didn't turn up that Sunday, I was him, so Brian, the manager, would come to us and say, like, you're Billy Hutton or you're Brian Sweeney or whatever, you know, and I was them. So one day at Scotchwood, I'm playing Scotchwood at the Scotchwood Sports Centre, and they put us on the bench, and I couldn't understand why. And uh, they never put us on, uh, being a little bit of a hothead even then, which I will talk about later, further on in the career. I showed I was. I, I threw my boots at Brian, I was only six. And he had to explain to us that there was a representative of the Northumberland FA there, so they couldn't, they couldn't actually put us on the pitch because they were frightened that they would get uh, found out. So, progressed Newcastle City boys, great guy called Brian Simpson, and then uh, from 11 or 12, about 11, got us to go to the Newcastle Centre of Excellence, um, which is like equivalent to their academies now, but without the unbelievable facilities they've got. and. Um, Went there and then at 14, um, the late great Joe Harvey, who was the chief scout, alongside a guy called Peter Kirkley, who was youth development officer, they asked me to to commit to the club and the club showed a lot of faith to give us a, at that time a contract that they'd never given before. So it was a, a two year schoolboy contract, a one year YTS scheme at the time. And then on my 17th birthday, two, three year professional contract. So, that's how it progressed. But going back, when I first went to watch Newcastle in 1980, um, that great Bill McGarry team with Bobby Shimpton and Billy Rafferty, uh, when my brother threw me over the top of the Gallagher, so I didn't have to pay. And if you remember, the Gallagher then had the um, glass cemented in over the top of the wall so people couldn't climb over. So my brother being very responsible at the time, throwing us over the top of there, God knows what he would have said to my mum and dad if I'd have landed on the glass, but luckily I didn't in his mate caught us, so he didn't have to pay for me. Um, and that 1980 team was, we had a, a story from that, a very funny story from that is, when I was Birmingham City manager, um, one of the home games, we got a result and I went across to the boardroom and uh, went to the boardroom speaking to the, the owner wasn't there at the time, and we'll talk about that later, but, a lot of the administration was in the boardroom and um, this guy come up to us and he said oh Lee nice to meet you and stuff like this and and he says uh, Newcastle how was your time there and I was like how did it start and I was like oh 
I went my first game in 1980, um, eight years old. I says, um, but we were shit. I said, uh, we had a front two with Bobby Shinton and Billy Rafferty. And this guy put his hand out his and he went, Lee, I'm Billy Rafferty. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I had to say, well, hey, Billy, I'm really sorry. He says, no, no, you were right, we were shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was it, really. Um, Signing a contract in Newcastle, what did that mean to you as a, as a Newcastle lad, Newcastle fan? Well, you know, what I was going to touch on at that time, I didn't, when I first went in the 80s, and then obviously the explosion in 82 with Kevin coming as a player, mm. um, you go there and you, you know, you're looking at these players and you're thinking they're playing on Newcastle United, and you never think that you can get to that level, you don't understand what it takes to get to that level. But then when the opportunity arose and then you sign for them, and you're thinking, wow, things are getting closer. And then you're captain England school boys, you're playing at Wembley twice in front of 80,000. Uh, things are starting to progress very, very quickly. You're starting to get a big name for yourself in the area and then nationally as well. Um, and then at 17, obviously Jim Smith gives you a debut. so. You basically end up living the dream because you're a kid from the banks of the Tyne and Walker, and um, you, you're doing something that you never believed possible. I mean, you know, my first few months I, I, I couldn't drive, so I used to get the bus, and um, both from Walker, and then when I moved to Walls End from High Farm, and get off at the Haymarket bus station, and uh, the driver used to let us off with a 50 pence fare. As long as I had a good game, he said. So I must have had a few good games because he never asked me reclaim this for the money. And um, yeah, that, that was it. I was just basically living every young lad's dream in the, in the city, to be honest. So you mentioned Jim Smith. Um, some people in Yale remember the Bald Eagle only too well. What was he, what was he really like uh, to, to play for? Terrifying. <laughs> Not great with me. Great as a kid. Uh, give us loads of confidence, but just absolutely crazy at old school. Mm -hmm. um, was there as a tough time, because obviously it was in between the old board and um, the Magpie group taking over. Done really well in his first season, but losing to our big rival Sunderland in the playoffs was a big blow for him. Give myself and Steve Watson my debuts the following season, me as a 17 year old Steve breaking the record as a 16 year old and um, yeah it was just absolutely mad it was the situation at St James was especially where you know we all went in our own suits and stuff and the senior lads would put, take their suits off get stripped into the, the, the match kit and put a towel over their, um, their gear and I thought that was just because that's what you've done as a senior player that, but I had to wait to do that but I quickly realised it was just because at half time Jim was partial to throwing a teapot at uh, people and <laughs> the team was going all over the suits so the lads were trying to protect their suits. I used to play alongside a guy called Roy Aiken. Mm -hmm. Roy was captain of Scotland at the time, record appearance holder for Celtic, won many, many trophies with Celtic, very well respected. Paid half a million pounds for him at the time, which at that time was a lot of money. And remember one of my first games for the Jim coming in at half time and uh, saying to Bobby Saxon, who was his assistant, who was the scout who said he was good enough? He's fucking useless. Sack him on Monday. <laughs> You're captain of Scotland. You're fucking shit. Thinking, oh my God. He's coming to me next. What am I going to do? But he just bypassed me and he went on to Quinny or something. And Quinny probably gave him a verbal back. So. But Jim was, uh, I'll always be invented with Jim. The man who gives you your debut. Um, unfortunately he's passed away now but he, he was old school he was tough we can never forget the man who gives you a debut for the club that you love and uh, so that's always something I remember you know tell us about the debut what was it like for you I mean was your family there no because at the time I went down it was Bristol City away as I came on as a sub um, and I didn't think I was going to be on the bench thought I was just going to be travelling as an extra player but then when the manager named the team in the subs and then Neil Simpson, that was signed from Aberdeen, he got injured after about 30 minutes and uh, Jim put me on and loved it. And then the week later, I made my full debut at St. James's against West Brom. 
Uh, so that the following week, the family were there. But the week before, we didn't think there was going to be anything. Bristol was a distance away. That my parents didn't have a car or anything like that. So it was it was difficult. So, um, but thankfully, the week later at St James's, when I made my full debut from the start of the game, they were all there to see, and it was a, a very proud moment. Jim Smith replaced by Ozzy Ardiles. And uh, Ozzy, of course, you know, doesn't get as much credit probably in our history. I mean, Jim gave you the debut, but, but Ozzy had faith in younger players. And of course, we all remember the, the Manchester United class of 92, but we had our own class of 92 at St James's Park, including yourself. Of course, I think mean, Ozzy was brilliant for the young players. He came in, he seen there was an agent, <clears throat> first team squad. And then he used to come to a lot of the youth team games. I think he came on Saturday afternoon before our home game, or Saturday morning, sorry, at the old Benmore training ground. And we beat Sunderland, our rivals, uh, 7 0. And 11 of those players the week later at Notts County, um, from that start 11, nine of us were in the 15 players that were in the first team. Uh, starting eleven and subs at Notts County, and he moved. He moved the senior players on. He, he went with the youth. He thought that was the the way forward. He gave us lots of encouragement, like to myself, Steve Watson, Steve Howie, Alan Thompson, Robbie Elliott, uh, Matt Ian, Richie Appleby, Alan Nielsen, many Lee Mayer, lots of players. So he was the one who uh, allowed these good young players we had at the club. And give us our heads and 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 trusted us. Obviously, when we were in the team together, we we're quite naive because we were young. A lot of these things showed up, and the results would be like, example, we're winning three 0 at half time against Charlton. In the first team, we lose four three. This type of stuff. But he kept believing in us, and even to the day he lost his job. But I think then Kevin come in. Kevin then seen the the quality of youngsters he had. But he realised he had to add a little bit of difference in terms of uh, a bit more seniority. We had Mickey Quinn, we had Gavin Peacock, these lads were good, but he needed a little bit more nous as well. So the likes of Brian Kittle Klein and Kevin Sheedy and then later on Barry Venison, Paul Bracewell, they came and added to, to what we had, you know. So and I think but Kevin never ever you know the the thing I always think about is Two things, us as a group of players, especially myself, Steve, Robbie Elliott, uh, Steve Howie, we we done well for the club, we got them to a certain level into the Champions League, finishing second on two, two occasions, and when we, we either decided to move on ourselves or the club decided to move us on, we went for big transfer fees in those days, nothing in comparison to what the day was, but you know, four million for myself, four and a half million for Steve, Watson, uh, three million for Steve Howie, only because of his injuries probably would have been a lot more. Robbie had three and a half million. So he yeah, was a group of local lads that had raised the club about 15 to 20 million, yeah. but also been successful on the pitch. And in today's market, that would have been probably pushing over 100 million. So that's that's the way you you, 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 you have to judge it, you know. You mentioned the, uh, you know, the battle for United um, a little bit earlier as well, you know, the takeover we've just been through uh, was monumental but that one was just as monumental in its time wasn't it the magpie group and you know we had we'd gone from um you know stan seymour and gordon mckeague then to george forbes and then john all um it was a massive massive time in the club's history wasn't it it was and the difference for me in terms of what's happened with ashley and you know this group now in terms of them they were local businessmen mm. who didn't have a lot of wealth or oh, we're wealthy people, but wealth to run a football club's different. Mm. And they were local businessmen and they didn't have the wealth to take the club to the next ne level. So John Hall came in and it was quite, it's, it's quite weird about how my young career followed a path and my son's young careers followed a similar yeah. path. So obviously the success I had with England schoolboys at the time my dad and me got asked to go up to St. James's, go to the boardroom, and Gordon McKeague was basically pleading with us, 
They'd accepted an offer from Liverpool at the time, which was in 1987. I was 15 years of age, a quarter of a million pound for me to sign for Liverpool. Now, my dad was telling Gordon McKee adamantly that I wasn't prepared to go. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go as well. It wasn't nothing. My, my dad was just passing my message on as the senior person in the family. So, and we got, we, we, we got contacted um, by the Magpie group to say, we understand what's going on. Don't let them put pressure on you. Don't, because they were basically saying, if I wasn't accept this deal to go to Liverpool, Newcastle were going bust because they needed this quarter of a million pound. And so, but then Sir John got his guys, John Woff and Peter Radcliffe and all those guys, Malcolm Dix to come and speak to me and say, listen, sit tight. Uh, the takeover's happening. So John is going to build the team around Geordies and he wants local lads like yourself in around it. So that was the reason. Because I was getting a lot of pressure on me at the yeah. time. Um, when people are saying to a 15 year old boy, you have to move, or the football club's going bust, it can take its toll, you know. So um, I basically just sat tight and then thankfully. Um, a few years down the line, Sir John got got it, got it over with and got it done so we could move forward as a football club. You've already mentioned him, Kevin Keegan. Mm. Hell of a gamble that really by Sir John Hall, wasn't it? They, um, you know, to bring him in. Freddie Fletcher, I think, really gets the credit for being the man who said, bring Kevin. Seven years on a golf course. <laughs> You know, no, good. no involvement of good on a golf course. <laughs> I don't have to play with him. No involvement in football whatsoever since he flew off in a helicopter in 1982 and John Old puts his money on him coming in. And I just, I remember that day, you know, the, the, coming through the double doors at the brewery. You know, it's a very famous clip which gets probably played millions of times on YouTube. But, you know, what, what did that mean to the players, especially, you know, yourself? At first it was tough. Because we felt we'd let Aussie down, someone we're very close with. Yeah. So it was tough for us. Me especially had a real good relationship with Aussie. But I knew we were bringing in a man because I'd experienced eight and two when he came in as a player. And what he'd done to a football club to turn it round from a mid-table um, League One as it was. Well, it was League Two then. It was second division, wasn't it? Then in the 80s. And what he'd done then and all of a sudden you're lopping thousands out the gates because it's a full house at St James's and he, he pulled the football club by its bootlaces and dragged it up within two seasons, got us promoted. I mean, that day when he he left on his last game against Liverpool in the helicopter, I thought that was the end of the world when I watched that game, I was broken hearted. So, um, I, uh, when he came back, I knew well, we were in a precarious position in the league. Um, it's easy to see in hindsight, but I just knew this was the man to get us out of that. This was the man to lift the whole club, the whole city. And, he, and he'd done it again. And um, then what he'd done afterwards with the help of Sir John Hall's wealth. I mean, the story goes, isn't it? It was Sir John who rang him up after Freddie Fletcher. It, it, got Kevin to come back and just said you've got the expertise and I've got the money let's get it let's get this club going forward and when you look back on that it's a bit spine tingling really mm. for what they said I, I remember the footage from when we beat Leicester 7-1 on that last game when we got promoted mm. and Sir so John had had a few glasses of champagne it's easy to see and he was getting interviewed and he said uh, look out Man United and Liverpool were coming for you in the Premier League, we're going to get into Europe. And probably the rest of the country probably laughed at him and ridiculed him, but when you look back, he was he was proved right. Yeah, no, he definitely was. The battle to stay up was the first battle that Keegan won the one. I mean, it was a hell of a, hell of a run-in, wasn't it? And I mean, it wasn't cut and drive. I think we all remember David Kelly's goal against Portsmouth, which really was pivotal in staying up. But that, that win at Leicester as well, um, where... You know, a lot of a lot of people went down without tickets and, and you know, just wanted to be outside the ground. But that was that almost felt like the rebirth of the club, didn't it? It was. I remember the game. I remember afterwards the the relief, the emotion. Um everyone just just thinking, Wow, we shouldn't have been in that place to start with, but 
we've got it sorted. Um, then there was obviously the situation because Kevin was a, a hard taskmaster, wasn't he? So he he, he wasn't going to let the board of directors <laughs> dictate to him. He wanted it done his way. He seen what could happen, and he was proved right. And uh, after a couple of scenarios where it looked like he wasn't going to stay as the manager, they got some agreement and he come back and he, he made some fantastic signings. You've got to say, I mean, you talk about the length of time he'd been out the game, so either one, he was unbelievable in terms of keeping in touch with the game, which would have been difficult in that era, yeah, uh, or he had very, very good people who we knew, very good contacts, because the signings he brought in in the Venisons and the Bracewells and the Beresfords, um, to 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 complement what was already there, um, was just absolutely unbelievable, really. And then as the season went on, because if you remember the the transfer windows weren't like what they are now, you could buy players all the time up until the last Thursday in March. And uh, what he'd done, he just continually improved the team. Scott Sellers, Andy Cole, like all these types of players were coming in. Rob Lee uh, were just continually improving us and um, that's where the similarity I've got with what he done and what's happened now with Eddie Howe and his recruitment team they didn't get many wrong in terms of the signings if any and, and, and that's the big thing to talk about in management results and recruitment and Kevin had that unbelievable and Eddie has that at the moment with his group you mentioned Brian Kilclain. Um, I mean, he was pivotal, wasn't he, really? I mean, he won the FA Cup with Coventry, but he was a, a colossus. And it was the experience that he had in the game, wasn't it? It clearly rubbed off on, on everybody around him. And as he said, Barry Venison had had such a good career, particularly at Liverpool uh, as well. So those two must have been big influences on young Geordie lads. Absolutely. Brian Kilclain was just, as you say, you talk about leaders. And people can lead in different ways. Brian led vocally but he also led on the pitch he was a giant of a man he obviously had all this hair and this beard and I mean if you something I, I didn't go out drinking with him that often because I could never keep up with him on the drink but when you did he, he'd suck the paint in one and three quarters it would be stuck on his tash and be drinking <laughs> down for the rest of the night but I mean he was just Kevin's gone on record Pound for pound, he says Rob Lee's his best signing, but the most important signing he made was Brian Kilclay because he gave us leadership, he gave us uh, a physicality on the pitch, he demanded high standards, he could put his arm around you, encourage you, but he could also, you know, give you a kick up the backside and demanded things on the on the training ground. Great guy. Um, funny story about Brian, I mean a promotion season. In about October, obviously Kevin was, um, obviously as you said, he'd been living in Marbia and Kevin decided to take us to Marbia for a little bit of a break in between games. And obviously, as I said, Brian liked a pint or two and he was always dressed smart. He'd always have like trousers on or corduroys, broke shoes or whatever, never go in tracksuits or trainers like us and would have a shirt on and either some other kind of coat and this time when we went to Marbella we flew from Heathrow and he had a brand new leather jacket on and um, Kevin took us into Heathrow went to uh, Harry Ramson's fish and chip place before we got on the flight and then we were allowed to disperse on our own before the f we got called the flight we're all on the flight and it's we're getting shouts of uh, last call Mr. Fazakli and Mr. Kilclain, which is obviously Derek Fazakli, the first team coach, and Brian. So Brian's got this brand new leather on, leather jacket, lovely long three quarter length jacket on. And uh, as he's running to get to the flight, he catches it on the rail on the um, on the staircase. That rips the pocket off, so the pocket's hanging off. <laughs> he gets on. Kevin gives Derek Fazakli the the, the 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 horrible glare, which is because basically he's a staff member, who should be sorted. So. Thinks nothing more of it, gets to Malaga on the bus, goes to the hotel, and Brian's the first off. And uh, he gets off the bus and he's he's walking, he's walking into the hotel like that. And, went, and I'm thinking, 
fucking hell, has he got injured on the staircase or what? And he's walking like that. And then when I looked, he had, as I said, he was wearing these, he used to wear these lovely brogues. But not he's been running, his pockets hanging off his leather jacket, his heels come off his brogue as well. So as he's carrying his bag, he's walking like that. But he's had that, that many drinks, he doesn't realise. <laughs> I wasn't going to tell him, that was for sure. <laughs> and that season was, was an incredible season, following on from a battle against relegation. You know, the, the team goes 12 games unbeaten and, and you know, it, it, leading that table, you know, throughout that season. Goalkeeper as well, who Jim Smith had signed, Pavel Cernicek, um, really shone that season as well. Ah, didn't God, God rest his soul, we love him. We miss him, we love him. Um, he was a great guy. Him and Tommy Wright had a great relationship together. The two of them, when they were called upon, Pav were loved. He took to the city, the fans took to him. Um, it was actually Jim who brought Pav in. Um, so Jim needs to take a lot of credit. Um, Pav was an unbelievable athlete. So, so well, great goalkeeper, great sense of humour. The lads loved him. Um, yeah, so that, that season when we got up that famous Pavel is a Jory t shirt, my, my brother got produced for him, so I, was, I should be getting a few quid off the back of them things. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, we love Pav. We love Pav. That was a, that's a, that's a, the downside of football, isn't it? When some, you lose people like that, he was such a special person for us, the players, and for the fans. He, he took to the fans well, they took to him. But uh, thankfully, we have great memories of him. I do we have great memories of the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got um, to mention as well Gavin Peacock and, and David Kelly because that partnership really, uh, just before they brought in Andy Cole at the, at the back end, um, you know, really served as well, didn't it? They were two great pros and, and scored a lot of goals. Gavin was a, a very, very high technical player, a very high technical player. He had great ability. Uh, he could play as the deeper striker, but he still chipped in with a high percentage of goals. Ned, David, he his goal scoring record here was phenomenal. Um, as you say, goes down in history as scoring that goal against Portsmouth would probably kept us in the, the now championship. And then the promotion season, I think, went on to score over 30 goals as well. So it was a terrific player for us, but it was just the ruthlessness of Kevin. Kevin didn't want to stand still. Yeah. If he thought someone had done well for him, but he thought there was someone better out there, he would go out and um, take him. And that's what he done with uh, Ned. He, he brought Peter Biazzi in, didn't he? And I was never going to have any... Co I love Ned. He was a great guy. Uh, a great player, great goal scorer. But I'd obviously watched Pedro at, in the 80s and he was one of my favourite players for me as the best player to ever wear black my shirt over a long period. I think if Paul had stayed longer, Paul Gascoigne, we could have been having a, a two-way race there. But for me, Peter, the best to wear in a black and white shirt. And um, for sure to have the chance to play alongside him. And he was the player coming in to replace Ned. You understand that. That 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 was the what Kevin done. Mm -hmm. He always raised the ball. The team and the squad, the bar was getting raised all the time. So for people like myself, a local lad, we had to continue to improve and impress to to be around that group, and uh, it was great for us. Um, but you know, as I said, um, great players coming all the time. So we had we had to uh, we had to improve. Yeah, of course. What was your thoughts when Andy Cole came in? Because he was a bit of an unknown to everybody. He played at Bristol, gone to Ar been at Arsenal, but um, you know, hadn't you know? I remember a lot of raised eyebrows. It was a lot of money as well. I think it was probably about one and a half million. I think well, Newcastle had spent on him. It he wasn't. Came. I knew Coley well. Yeah. We played together on all the um, England youth teams together, and under twenty ones, and I knew him well. Um, he was a f fantastic player then. I knew what he was about. So, uh, but I didn't know that we were interested in signing him. Corey didn't at the time as well. I remember when Kevin went to watch him with Terry McDermott. Um, he, had, he picked up an injury early in the game and he lasted till about the 60th or 70th minute, but he didn't make a big contribution in the game because he was injured. But I remember Kevin always saying to me afterwards, that was all he needed to take. He knew 
he had the goal scoring ability because he'd been proven out of Bristol City. He, he'd obviously seen footage of him, he knew what his attributes were in terms of his pace and his movement. But he's seen a player there who looked very committed, even though he picked it up an injury early in the game. He was a lad who was trying to stay on the pitch and play as long as he could. So we're on our way to Swindon. And uh, the team coach had the old big, was uh, the mobile phones then, so the gets a call, the bus driver, Ken, he calls me down, says it's the manager, Kevin and Terry were travelling separate. And he just said to me, listen, I've got your mate coming. And I was like, oh, who do you mean? He's like, we signed down the call from Bristol City. Was it 1.2 million at the time? And I says, yeah, that'll do. And he says, what do you think? And I says, yeah, that, that'll do us. He'll, he'll, not thinking what his record would end up being. Um, and he came in and, he just from the first, he was very nervous. He knew he'd come to a big club. He knew he'd come to an area where they love football. And uh, he just, his, his record is phenomenal, isn't it? His goal scoring record, I think, is it? Something like 63 goals in 68 games. Yeah, something, something like that. I mean, obviously, big, big Huey Gallagher's record. Sure, so, yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. I mean, Coley was shy and uh, people. Th- took that for arrogance, it wasn't, it was, he's a quiet guy, he liked his own space, but even he surprised as the time he rang us up and he said, uh, Slim, that's what he used to call us, because I used to be Slim then, <laughs> obviously not now, so I could call us that now, that would be uh, a funny nickname, and he said to us, uh, do you want to help us move into my new house, and I says, yeah, yeah, no problem, I says, uh, where, are you, where are you going to live, he said, Crook, I said, where the fuck's Crook? <laughs> he said, well, you're from the northeast. I says, yeah, no, and I don't know where the fuck Crook is. <laughs> so I went and I helped them move in and uh, we'd moved all these boxes all day. It was a Saturday afternoon. And uh, I said, to him, come on, we'll go for a bite to eat and you can buy me a beer for um, helping, you, helping you move all this furniture and that. And no word of a lie, we walked in this bar in Crook I walked in, it was fine. Coley followed in behind us. The thought they'd seen a fucking alien. <laughs> a black man going into Crook in a bar for the first time in 1993. And it was like, I looked at him and he looked at me and I thought, nah, this ain't working. <laughs> so we stayed, everyone was fine. There was no issues, don't get us wrong. We stayed, we got up sandwich and stuff. But on the way home from there, I remember ringing, I rang the gaffer, Kevin, and I said, gaffer, I says, uh, Nasha, and he says, how are you doing? I says, um, I've just been with Coley to help him move in. He went, oh, good lad, that's good. I says, no, Gaffa, that's not. I says, he's moved into a place in County Durham called Crook. He says, Crook, I don't know it. I says, well, I don't, to be honest. I says, but it's, it's not right. I says, I know he wants his own space. I says, but it's it's not going to be right for him, for various different reasons. And then the next day, Freddie Shepard had contacted him and ended up getting him in a apartment in Jesmond, um, overlooking the cricket ground, <laughs> which was a little bit different. But you know that, that that's the way Coley was, and uh, but we had to keep an eye on him all the time because a lot of people had this reput- um, idea that he was arrogant mm-hmm. and he was aloof. He actually wasn't, he was the opposite. He was very nervous and all this. He'd gone from something, because he'd never really made it at Arsenal. He was a kid there and then he'd gone to Bristol City. And with all due respect to Bristol City, it wasn't like coming to Newcastle, and especially when the team was doing successful. And he was like the main man. He was the, the god, the number nine at the time. And he just found that a little bit difficult, but you know, we got him, we got him through that. That first season in the Premier League was the, the birth, really, of the, the entertainers, wasn't it? The, um, you know, the, the way that Newcastle started that season and, and, and you know, flew up the table. It, it was incredible. Played some wonderful football. And as you mentioned, Peter Beardsley coming back to the club for the second time. And another big-name player, um, you know, joining you know, Kevin Keegan's team. Well, you talk about the start, Steve. We, we actually started the season quite poorly. We, we lost our first season. game. Of yeah, we lost our first game against Spurs at home. I think Teddy Sheringham scored, and then we I think we lost to Coventry. Mm-hmm. And then 
what a nice easy one at Old Trafford after that. Uh, and we went there and we played really well. And uh, as you said, Nicky Papavassel who scored. Um, easy for you to see, especially after a few pints. <laughs> um, but Nicky scored and uh, we got a really good 1-1 one -one draw there. And I think that was the game that where we thought, you know what, we can handle this. This is not a problem. And uh, we just kicked on from there. We went from strength to strength. And uh, we, the belief came into the team and, you know, uh, thought, yeah, we belong here. And I think, did we finish third that season? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I think that was the build-up. I think the start was a little bit of a shock because we'd actually romped away with the championship. And obviously the 7-1, the last game of the season, everyone's like doing this. Then you're signing Peter Beardsley and all oh, the signings that Kevin had made. You go into it, and then oh, a couple of games. It's like oh, this is reality now. We're at the top level, but the Man United game was the catalyst for it to think right. If we play like that, um, we can handle this, and we did. We did. we kicked on through the league, and um, you know we we played some great football, um, and we we, we treat every game the same. Home or away was, you know, it's funny. You know, you hear because obviously football now is. It's it's constant, isn't it? It's twenty four seven. If you want to watch football twenty four seven, you can. And there's some terrific pundits out there and they analyse everything and they've got these screens and they talk about tactics and this, that, and the other. And I, there was a thing the other week about main games and it, it, obviously the main games. One comes back, oh, we'd love it if we beat them. You know, you've done that. Sure, would love it. But it, that, it's it, it's not main games. It's passion for your club. It's just like no, no one's getting in your head. It's it's about being right for your club, and 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 that's what happened then. And we just had a group of players that were getting better and better. And as I said, no transfer windows then. And Kevin just seemed to be bringing a player in who brought the level up again, brought the level up again, brought the level up again, and and and, and that's what he done unbelievably. You mentioned KK, and I love it if we beat them. We'll come to that. But he also stood on the steps at St James's Park when he sold Andy Cole and uh, addressed the supporters. I mean, you know, that was that was incredible, wasn't it, really? Well, that, that was that was Kevin. That summed Kevin up. And the story to that was, obviously, me and Coley were big pals. We bought properties next to each other, so we used to share the drive into training each day. And uh, the morning of the deal, when it got announced, later in the day it was his turn to drive me into training and he was laid back but he was you know i think i'd got him into a position where he wasn't we're never late and it was his turn to drive is it and then i'm thinking he's late where is he where is he and then it got to the stage where i thought Damn it, i'm not paying a fine because of him and i jumped in my car and i shot off and i couldn't get a hold of him which was quite uh unique i could always get grab him and then um, as the day come on the news started to break and then I had a message on my phone it was off Coley saying listen Slim I couldn't tell you the information I come to Manchester last night it was all hush hush because Manchester were playing Sheffield United in the cup and um, so what they done is uh, Coley came to us uh, left us Keith came to us and then I think was it 6 million quid in return and they just said I could, I, it was all hush hush I couldn't and I say as well thank god I made that decision because it looked like I was going to get a fine for being late um, and like you say but then obviously at the time he was all he was wearing the famous number nine he was doing terrific things the fans like any fan would do they get a little bit oh what's happening here we're so our best player because if you remember, Newcastle had always had, before Sir John Hall, we'd sold uh, Chris Waddle, we'd sold Peter Beardsley, we'd sold Paul Gascoigne, we'd sold the Crown Jewels to keep the club going. And they're thinking, oh, is this going to be the same again? Are we doing this again? And Kevin come out on the steps in typical Kevin fashion and said, basically said to the fans, trust is, if it fails, I know the consequences, but he knew. He knew what he was doing. He had everything lined up. Kevin was a shoot. Because I never, you know, I don't know if anyone knows this story. I've told it 
before but if people in here before Crowley left we had loads of time to ourselves after training Kevin's office was in the old Milburn stand at the reception you remember that so we would go back there sometimes and just sit in reception and mess around rather than you know do what I do now and go to the pub which is the wrong thing to do um, but then when I was an athlete we'd do that so uh Kevin came out of his office with Terry McDermott one day and he said, right, you two come with us. Right, what's happening? Didn't ask any questions. I've got your coats, no problem. Gets in the back of Keegan's car. Couple hours later, we're at Anfield. Director's box at Anfield. Kevin Keegan, Terry McDermott, me, Andy Cole. Liverpool versus Cute we are. And, uh, he leans across to me and Cole and he says, after about half an hour, you like to play with that fella? It's Les Ferdinand. I said, yeah, he's, he's very good. We played against him, we knew what Les was about, powerhouse, terrific footballer. And Cole, he said, yeah, I could play alongside him. And then Cole, he was asking questions, where does Peter fit in and how do we do this and do that? Not knowing that he was the one getting fucked off. <laughs> 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 He's asking where Peter's playing. He was the one getting fucking fiddled. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way football works. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, I mean, that, them type of things when you think now, you know, it's like unbelievable the manager had to do that. I'm only joking. I think at that time, Kevin didn't have any inclination of selling Coley. Yeah. I think the deal that just came very... I think the Coley deal happened so quickly and it was one of them at the time and it was like, do we do it? Can we reinvest or whatever? So, um, yeah, that, so he already had Les lined up without knowing, I don't know, he might have already spoke to Les and Les was already lined up to come to us because I know there was a lot of clubs in for Les. He was the one of the best strikers in the business at that time, you know, with Coley, with Shearer. So, I don't know, it, it, it was just, that's how he worked, he was, he was brilliant. He, and that's, I don't know, when you look back, sometimes you think, did you already have that deal lined up? Because you were so confident when you were at the top of them stairs. But I think that's, and then, but then I think on another way, I think Kevin was so honest and he loved the fans in the club, he was like, please let me manage. And mm -hmm. if I if I let you down, I'll walk mm -hmm. and believe in this. And if you believe in this and I mess up, I won't hang around. And that was to be proved right, you know. Les came in, had the number nine shirt, another person you know, well deserving of it. He didn't have it for long though, because Newcastle went and broke the, the world record um british record world record 15 million pound for alan shearer who was you know doing so well at blackburn and and, and making inroads with england question i'm going to ask you because peter beardsley's been down here um and done four shows off the belt and it's a story that i'd heard from different people and i'm sure i've asked you this question before but i'm not sure whether you're going to give us the same answer the shirt right i always thought the big problem was alan and les and the number nine shirt but actually, it got passed down, didn't it? This this whole problem because with with Les having to give up the number nine and Alan taking a number nine, it then meant that somebody that Peter had to have his shirt changed, and then eventually it came to you. What what happened, and, and how did you feel about all of this? Well, what happened was Alan understood what the number nine meant. He followed the club. He knew Jack, the Jackie Milburn story. He knew all the famous players who played for Newcastle more than nine. He wanted to be it. He was the best centre forward in the business. And he wanted to have that shirt. Les Ferdinand had it. Um, Les was never going to kick up a fuss, to be honest. But what they said to Les was, because Les, at that time, like numbers, it wasn't 1 to 11. It was the first era where 1 to 11 wasn't really the starting players. You had different players. And Les says, well, I'll pick a different number. And um, I think it was a couple of the board of directors said, no, we want you to wear 10. And he said, no. He said, Nash has got 10. He deserves it. He wears it. He, he does great for the club. And he says, no, you're wearing 10. And um, 
he wasn't too happy about it. Peter went to eight, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, when Kevin come to us and he said, look, look at we, you know, Alan's taking the nine, the directors want Les to have 10. And I'd spoke to Les because what happened when Coley left, Les rented Coley's house so we become neighbours and become really good friends. And he's one of the best guys you'll ever meet in football. And we thought about this and uh, I didn't think too much of it at the time. Looking back, I should have been a bit more pissed off. I should have, because I, I should have thought to myself, just because I'm a local lad, don't treat us like that. I'm mm -hmm. still an important member of the group. Mm -hmm. um, I should have dug my feet in. And I, I know Les wouldn't have been bothered, but I just thought to myself, well, it's a number. Don't worry about it. Kevin got me in and asked, and as usual, I probably had my usual Barney with Kevin, which we had on a regular basis. Probably tell him to fuck off, and he kicked us up the arse or something like that, which was a regular occurrence. Um, and I just, but later when I look back, I thought, you think to yourself, nah, you, sh you shouldn't have let that happen. Mm -hmm. you should have dug your feet in and, and made more of it. But because I just looked playing for the club, whatever number they were giving us or whatever I was wearing, it, it wasn't important to me. It was just where if I was playing in the team and, and, and what have you. So, um, and especially, I, I still speak to Les and I know you, you, you've done lots of things with Les. I think he still feels uncomfortable with that because mm -hmm. me and him got on great with, you know, loads of respect for each other. Um, but that's the way it was and uh, so we, we, we just had to move on it it didn't cause any problems it was, you know we we never had anything like that in in in, in that era in terms of it can be classed as petty things but when you look back now you probably think no nah, I should have I should I should have I stood my ground a little bit better than I did Um, just shouldn't have been trekked oh he's a local lad he'll just accept another number so, nah, it was, but that's the way it went in. I think, yeah, Peter was another person who stuck up for us on that one because, you know, they knew what it was meant and I'd worn it for a while and we'd been doing well. So, that, that's football. It is. And that's the end of the first half, ladies and gentlemen. Put your hands together for Lee. <laughs> we'll continue with the entertainers in the second half. John's going to come round now.